I'm David McDonald. This is a story about conservation. About the wild crew. And perhaps most of all, about a way of doing things. To achieve anything in life, you need two things. You need a lot of luck and you need really good friends. And goodness me, my story is of somebody who's had both in really unfair measures. This institution that we have built here is the result of two people supporting me who put their money where my mouth was. The first were the incredible trustees of the so-called Tubney Trust who honouring the memory of their friends who had previously owned Tubney House but bequeathed it to us in their memory, we were able, having restored the house, it took me a year's work of restoration, to set up an institution which you now see behind us. An institution that has empowered, educated, informed, influenced more than a hundred graduate students thousands of conservation biologists and now we can see millions of people in the wider public around the world. And on top of that, the second set of people who put their money where my mouth is were my dearest friends Tom and Daphne Kaplan, who came here watching us trying to survive by finding money from day to day, hand to mouth, and decided to endow the running costs of the Wild Crew at Tubney House in perpetuity. And I remember the occasion standing by that door just behind me, talking to Daphne and saying, actually with tears in my eyes when they told me about the endowment, you and Tom have just delivered my lifetime's dream, my vision. And she turned to me and said, no, no, you're entirely wrong. You've just delivered ours. It was quite a emotional moment for me and we've gone on from then to build this institution to deliver practical conservation solutions around the world and internationally I remember the window behind us there is our lecture theatre the other day I was in our lecture theatre with a group of our team members and looking around the room I counted in the team at the moment in one room at one time 34 different nationalities people from Laos to Brazil, uh, people from Azerbaijan to Borneo, all working together for a common cause to deliver the Wild Crew's mission of evidence-based conservation policy, solving practical problems with the world-class science. So, let me introduce you to Tubney House, our centre. Oh, and our logo. I hope you can see there the fox's face reminding us of our earthy biological field roots. And then can you see a pen nib? Think of analysis and meticulous science. And of course, a book with its spine and the pages open facing away from you. Education and dissemination. It says it all. So the next, the next wonder of the world are our Panthera buildings. It's our training centre and the people that we're training there are changing the world. So the truth is we work on everything here from butterflies to bats, from rodents to primates. But a lot of the guys that work here and particularly the people we train are fascinated by big cats, hence the marvellous panther sculpture we have here. And this is our Panthera Training Centre, where I really believe we're training the world. Each year, we scan the world to find the eight or ten most enterprising, most committed, most talented young conservation professionals from often rather humble backgrounds and generally from the poorest countries in the world. And we give them the opportunity, fully funded as a result of the sponsorship that we enjoy, to come here and study total immersion, total immersion 
for seven months. They live here, we've got our teaching facility, we've got common rooms, kitchen, dormitories, and they live as a community working together to understand conservation. These people come from all over the world. We've had people from the emerging economies, from Brazil, Russia, China, India, and from the poorest countries in the world. We've had people from throughout Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, Central African Republic, part of the bottom billion countries, people in the world. And we've also, throughout Indochina, had people from Cambodia, from Laos, from Vietnam, from also from Bhutan, from Myanmar. So everywhere you go around the world, we're influencing conservation, training people, training the trainers. The other day, I was at a breakfast meeting in Rwanda, in Kigali, with the African Leadership University. It's a wonderful institution. And there were 10 Africans from different countries at the breakfast. And every single one of them had met and worked with one of our diploma students or one of our graduate students. I'd never met any of them before. Every single one of them had been touched by people that we train. The absolutely wonderful thing about our Wild Crew Panthers, our diploma students, is that each year our community here is enriched and we learn from them as much as they learn from us by eight or ten people from Bhutan to Borneo to Brazil who spend seven months here with us. Each year a new map of the world, a new community of people going out to impact conservation and actually it's been pretty successful and I'm just thrilled to tell you that that uh, Queen Elizabeth gave us her award for higher education for saying that our course was the best thing in Britain that year. So imagine the, the pride, the joy of being able to take young wild crew panthers from Indochina, from Africa, from South America to Buckingham Palace to meet and to be personally congratulated by the Queen. So here we are at Lady Margaret Hall. It's the Oxford College that had the courage in 1986 to go with my idea of creating the first research fellowship in wildlife conservation in, as far as I know, any university anywhere in the world. And nowadays, many of the Wild Crew graduate students and all of our Wild Crew Panthers are associated with this college. This is the Conservation College. So I'm in a different habitat now. This is the library at Lady Margaret Hall. And it's a habitat that requires being very quiet indeed. I'm a a bit like a chameleon, I move so, through so many different habitats and each one I have to blend in. So I'm in a rather a different form of dress today, but I'm looking for a particular graduate student of mine. Here she is now. More angels. Oh, I'm so sorry to disturb you in this library. That This is More Angels. She's a remarkable graduate student just finishing off four years of work on a doctoral thesis here on the lions of Wangi National Park in Zimbabwe. And a wonderful thing, quite apart from her work, is that in the aftermath of the Cecil episode, we got lots of donations and we were able to use those to fund the training of a cohort of fantastic young Zimbabweans, of which More Angels is the prime example. So More Angels, tell me, What's the single most important thing in all these years of study of Wangi Lions that you've learned from your research? So one of the most important things I found in my thesis is that prey patriotism affects several aspects of lion ecology and behaviour, including the social dynamics of lion pride in Wangi National Park. That's fascinating, that's brilliant. And tell me about you, so personally or professionally, what's it meant to you to be part of the Wild Crew at Oxford? 
Uh, being a world crew, I've met several world-class scientists from around the world and I've been able to learn from them and interact with different people and different projects across the world. Wonderful. And how amazing to be here in this gorgeous Oxford Library. I, I can't resist showing off just a tiny bit because I've just noticed, look, here, suitably beside more angels, these are two two wild crew books that we use for training people. A lot of the work in these books based based on wild crew research and um, as if as if by magic. Look at this, here's here's another one, which is a encyclopedia of mammals that actually I'm rather proud to say has been read by hundreds of thousands of young people around the world and hopefully fired their enthusiasm for these magnificent animals. Anyway, look, we've disturbed more angels too much. I'm going to put that away. I'm so sorry to disturb you. Good luck. In terms of training capacity building, I mean, one incredible thing is I think I'm on my 100th doctoral student trained successively here from every nook and cranny of the world. And some of them have achieved remarkable things. For example, that guy sitting quietly in the corner over there, Mohammed, has been studying Persian leopards in Iran. It's pioneering work. Look, let me show you. Okay. Hi, Mohammed. Sorry to disturb you. So what have we got here? So this is a film which uh, I just received from Iran and it's for one month ago. Female leopard. Amazing. Okay. Look at these cubs. Yeah. I mean this is astonishing, world beating stuff. And the exciting thing is that these cubs have been born probably in September which is quite unusual for the leopard in such a seasonal country. Which means that these animals are breeding year round. Yeah. Which we never know before. Yeah. So Mohammed, what do you think is the single most important thing you've discovered from all these years of working with these animals? I think there is much hope now to save them in, in the wild. And this is something that I learned through the years of studying as my PhD here in Wild Crew, that the population is much higher in some areas than what we thought before. They can have much smaller home ranges within even the current range of the, current range of the protected areas. And they are in, in some areas they are in low conflict with people. All of these bring hope to the future of these animals in such a neglected part of the world for Fantastic. conservation. For conservation. Fantastic. Tell me, what what does it meant to you being part of the wild crew? So uh, basically, to be the first one from most of the region as the Middle East in wild crew and in department of zoology, it's a it's a I'm very proud of that. And so it had brought me lots of capacities in terms of scientific skills and also communication with the broader context and conservation communities, which without that, it was impossible for me as someone from that region to achieve lots of achievements in the region and also globally. Fantastic. And with your thesis going in yesterday, we are proud of you, that's for sure. Thank you. I won't disturb you anymore. Thanks, yeah. Mohammed. Considering all the beautiful, charismatic, majestic creatures we work on around the world, lions, leopards, wolves, jaguars, magnificent, charismatic, why, you might ask, would we be interested in a small rodent? Well, here we are at the side of the River Thames in Oxfordshire, perfect habitat for the humble water vole, tiny little vole-shaped thing that in my childhood was super abundant on these waterways. Actually, it was made famous in the book Wind in the Willows, uh, Kenneth Graham's book about Ratty the Water Vole. Then, disappearing faster than rhinos have disappeared from Africa, the water vole vanished. Why? Not just because of habitat loss, not just because of agricultural intensification, but because of the release in this country and actually the release from Patagonia to Belarusia of the American mink. 
The American mink became wildly valuable to the fur trade in the 1930s. It was exported around the world to fur farms from which it inevitably escaped. They bred in the British countryside. The water vole had no protection against the American mink, hadn't evolved with it, and soon, as I say, disappeared faster than rhinos from Africa. So we have researched every aspect of water vole biology, mink biology, all the other small creatures that live in that ecosystem to be part of a restoration scheme that has used science to solve the problem, to restore water voles to British countryside. And that has been part of a much wider project that has kept me going for about 40 years now while we've been busy overseas on the back burner at home where we've studied every element of the farmland around here, whether it's deer or badgers or foxes or birds or butterflies or moths or the small creepy crawlies in the river. We've tried to take every part of the farm system apart and work out how farming can better coexist alongside healthy nature in the countryside. And our work has happily, and I'm proud of this, informed government policy regarding agri-environment schemes, has influenced thousands of farmers in the UK and across Europe and more broadly, and influenced agri-environment policy across the European Union. So the humble water vole is one of the moving parts in our understanding of farmland, and that understanding leads to national, in fact continent-wide, agricultural policy for the benefit of wildlife and for the people who use the countryside.